because um, as you heard about blood testing things and whatnot, probably in 20 or 30 years you're going to have lots of gadgets inside your body. But at the moment, we've got lots of gadgets outside our body. And so in a sense, I'm, I'm going to go through uh, what, you know, where is that going and uh, where does it come from and how does it all mix in with cyberspace and street space, etc. So let's get going. Next slide, please. So the, the first one, I think in a sense, uh, the digital you first appeared in cyberspace around 25 years ago, people were online. They were online at places like the Palo Alto Research Center or people on the ARPANET, and they suddenly had a digital self. They had a, a handle, they emailed, they were in MUDs in the early games, early computer games. And that digital self sort of grew up through the 80s, and it, uh, it matured into what we call now massive multiplayer online gaming, or you know, every different term for it. And, uh, People established an identity. They established a, a visual character that they could walk around in these virtual worlds in. And that character had lots of cool gadgets and wares and capabilities and powers and whatnot. And probably not. How many of you played online gaming? Quite a few. So the next slide. So uh, you'd recognize some of these, these scenes. The Sims, yeah. So you, you not only had the digital self, you had the whole dysfunctional family as a self. <laughs> and uh, this is EverQuest up on the top. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. And I just want to give you sort of a peek into one of these worlds. Um, our organization, Digital Space, uh, working with our Australian team here, uh, who are from rural Victoria. And that's, this is the, where our design studio is, here in, uh, here in Victoria. Uh, over the years, I've done tons of projects, lots of projects for NASA right now. We work for with Adobe for years. Um, but before that, we were doing experiments in the, the, the cyber salt. We were doing these massive online events every year. In fact, we may do another one at the end of this year. But we have you know, several thousand people who come into virtual world as avatars. And this is the, the grand finale from one of these events. Uh, I think it was Avatars 2000, yeah. this particular one. And all of these are characters, and they have names and handles and various appearances and capabilities. And if you go to the next slide, that's me. I was, I was given the conference chair avatar. And at these events, it would be a big party, but there'd be all like speakers, and you have a convention center, which in this year was a big space station, which we blew up at the end. And uh, this was a place where you could get immersed. So some people were in this event for 10 hours straight. Mm -hmm. And walking around, meeting people, etc., inside a virtual world in cyberspace. And uh, one of the tricks we do every year is to, if somebody's in an event for about 10 hours, they really are completely lost in it. It's like being lost in a great, in a good book or whatnot. And we do uh, the Avatar Awards, called the Avies, at the end of the event, and then we do a sort of a surprise. And this particular year, we blew up the world. We took it all apart. And we measured sort of the, the response of the audience, and many people wrote that they felt as though they were falling into the computer, and you'll see why. So this particular year, we built a space station, and we had several thousand people milling through it, going to talks, and showing their art, showing their webcams on surfaces, the things you can do in a virtual world online. And uh, then we did a surprise event. So we'll go to the next. It's a bit of a film here. Oh, so actually, we can go about one. So this is a movie shot off the screen. Excuse the quality. And what we're doing is fielding these little globules, which are bots that are eating up the, po the polygons. And they're destroying this station. And the attendees who are standing on this platform are about to fall because they're going to destroy the platform. That's me. There's one of the, the globules. Sort of like Pac-Man. And I'm, I'm unbeknownst to the audience who are in their avatars, you can see them moving around, uh, they're now going to fall into a vortex hole. So we, we produced this vortex, a wormhole, and we turned gravity on and off they went down the vortex. But after somebody's been in an event for so long, they're very immersed, they, as they say, they felt they were falling into the computer.
So off they go. So it's sort of a digital self-collective. And here we go down the vortex. And we'll end up in there, I'll just drop down at the bottom to the state of this belief. This is of course done about five years ago, so the graphic quality is a little different today. But it was experiments, we did about five, six years of experiments in, in messing around with the virtual world medium. So there's everybody. And there I am at the end. And everybody just had a party after all this time in this event, all built by volunteers. So sort of a little bit of a nano world there visually, but. So I think we can stop this one. So Interestingly enough, uh, our group around 1999 started getting funding by NASA because I knew the people I knew. <laughs> um, I knew several astronauts, I knew a lot of NASA researchers, and we started doing projects to model space vehicles. And the time that I have today is way too short to go through this enormous amount of stuff. If you go over to the hall, there's a stand, and you'll find our team there and John, and you can actually uh, drive some of the virtual vehicles with a joystick. Uh, we're doing a lunar bucket wheel excavator for a lunar excavation, which will fly around 2011. So we're modeling it with physics so you can move it around on a simulated surface of so the lunar surface. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually, that bucket wheel excavator is about this big. And if anybody you know who's in mining, bucket wheel excavators sometimes are six stories high. So that's a nano version of a, <laughs> it's a lunar flight, flight vehicle. Uh, but um, what we have been doing with NASA Ames Research Center is a lot of years of modeling humans in vehicles, say, on Mars or the Moon, in hypothetical situations. And we actually model uh, a desert research station in Utah, which NASA uses to put crews on a sort of a simulated Mars mission. And I'll show you some, uh, some I think there's video after this. Go one more board. So that's it there. And, uh, here comes the, uh, the EVA crew. So what NASA is doing in this case is they're modeling humans that are, again, digital cells because they're, they're transmitting themselves off GPS, off satellites, their position, their, their body functions, their vital signs. And they're using that to drive robotics. Actually, go to the next one. So there, they are. there they go. And this is out in the desert, it's a Mars-like desert environment. That's the uh, satellite for the GPS. We can go to the next one. And this is Boudreaux, a robot built at Johnson Space Center, and it, it follows you. Um, and it does several complex things, and it maintains communication bridges with the habitat. It's in the uh, Utah desert. And we'll go to the next one. And Boudreaux had a little problem. Turn up the sound here. Jeff, uh, Boudreaux is stuck on a rock. Over, what do you want to do? So anyway, <laughs> Boudreaux figured out it was stuck on a rock. So the, the idea there, we, we do a lot of modeling of astronauts on orbit uh, for, for repairs, for training, just in time training for re repairing the space station. I can't show that video because I think we're missing a codec. But the idea is that in the space station, when you're in a flight hardware, you're, you're not only uh, inside the station or you're outside working, I mean, you're totally instrumented and you're totally surrounded by technology that is trying to give people on the ground the idea of what's going on on board. They even are building a little robot about the size of a ducted fan, like a basically hairdryer fans. They can move itself around. It's the eyes. It's the avatar of a controller on the ground. And it can move itself around the station. And they give it a human, ex sort of a facial expression. So it's kind of a member of the crew. It's a fascinating device. It's not really a nanobot. But it's, it, it can autonomously move itself to the state, throughout the station. And that'll, that'll fly in a couple of years. But, um, when you are uh, in an environment like that, you're part of a bigger software system. 
And as you know, it becomes more important for vital signs monitoring, and these now devices will make your health part of that that now system. But uh, I think that human beings, one of the transformations that we're going to undergo in the next 20 years, as the devices like these get smaller and smaller, they become portable, become mobile, become powered by little generators uh, in your feet. You know, that will generate the electric power. There will be even ways to, to power them to the body heat, the heat exchangers. So if you, you know, if you eat a hamburger, you're going to generate a little bit of juice for you. <laughs> your body heat will generate some juice. So you'll become instrumented beings. And there's privacy questions and whatnot. But um, it's going to be fascinating, because it's just that's the way it's going. Uh, people don't want their commu computing at a desk, necessarily, now. And so the idea of the virtual world and the virtual self is now getting mapped right on to the, your, your actual physical self. And so sort of looking at the next phase of, of virtual worlds, it's really street space. We did a project. Uh, at a place called the Fashion Institute of Technology in, in New York City. And they said, we had a bunch of nerds that came down from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for a wearables conference that we sponsored and about four or five years ago. And the fashion professors, many of whom were women who are designers, these guys came down, people like Steve Mann, and had, he kind of looks like he's been assimilated by the board, you know, a little bit. And they had all their stuff in their Velcro and all that stuff. And, and, and the fashion professor said, we couldn't, look, we, we, couldn't under, we didn't even understand what they were talking about. We just were horrified by how horrible they looked. <laughs> so there was a complete cultural dis, disjunction between the two. And so they kind of threw it all away. And they said, there's no way to put technology with fashion and make things that, that look good, that actually and appeal to people. And so about three years ago, a professor friend of ours at FIT said, well, we're kind of going to do, have another go at this. You know, we gave up on the MIT people. We're going to have another go at this. But we're going to make uh, a fashion show inside cyberspace. So the students actually made the garments. Because the students make one garment a year so it, because of the limited resources in, in the labs. And then another set of students made avatars inside a virtual world. So this is Leon here with his dreadlocks which are made out of stripped Brooks Brothers business suits. And that's his, his avatar there. If you go to the next slide, you see a few more. And so these are some of the drawings that were done on the right and some of the avatars in a 3D world that were done. Now this is kind of, kind of poking at something, so trying to find your way forward. These students also play massive multiplayer games. Now it turns out that there's a way now for, it's almost like an inkjet printer, there's something called a whole garment knitting system, which starts with a, a bunch of reactant, and it actually can make a garment based on a 3D model in about two minutes. It comes out the bottom of the machine. It kind of looks like an inkjet printer hung upside down, and looks like spaghetti's coming out. But it can even you know, weave into the fibers the elasticity and the color and whatnot. And so, Truthfully, there's kind of this weird convergence that might happen between somebody wants to go out to a club and wear a really cool garment, then couldn't, why couldn't they have the garment completely designed for them? Why wouldn't they go to Bloomingdale's and get scanned in a cyber scan and put their credit card into a slot and then the wall screen lights up and then they see their body clothed in different variants and they decide what they want and they push the button and the garment's made even with electronics in it, lighting, etc., and then they put it on and they go. Now that garment could look like their, play, their game character, which is their self in cyberspace. You see where I'm going here. So let's go to the next. Now, interestingly enough, what, what fashion do you start with? How do you, how do you start out? Uh, you know, what, what kind of styles do you use? You can't kind of do a lot of this stuff because the, the, the items are a little bit bulky. You can't can't do things with really flimsy material. Just doesn't contain a lot of the gadgets that we have. Uh, a lot of companies are making uh, like things that look hunting jackets, or you know things that look like journalists who used to carry 50 lenses, you know, photojournalists, and all that stuff. According to the FIT professors, is, is horrible and ugly, and, and that's why they don't even look at it. And in the, the apparel business, you know, there's, that's kind of a niche. 
generally appeals to people like me, guys in their 40s, you know, kind of with, with no sense at all. But it, tur it turns out that somewhere around the 15, uh, 1560s into the middle of the sort of 1700s, you had this boom that was going on in Europe where the textile industry was flowering and where credible technology had come from China and from India and, and they were making <coughs> garments like you can't believe. I mean, it kind of reached a peak uh, at, at that time for men and for women. I mean, the, the, the court of Louis XIV, I mean, this, this, this stuff was so incredibly elaborate. Headpieces and everything, it just blows your mind. You can't see anything like that today. Um, and so what we decided to do on this project was to go back to that period, and this is one of my ancestors, his name Admiral John Harmon, who died, he's about five foot tall, but he died fighting for Queen Elizabeth I around, I think about 1580. But so I always had this picture of this guy, and I said, well, what if I made a garment that was like from this era, because look at all, he can carry all this, this stuff, he's got a scabbard, he's got lots of stuff there. Because these garments actually were kind of a life savings for some people, they were incredibly expensive. And people generally could carry lots of things. Now, if you're if you're a Scot, you've got your all your stuff underneath and carry all your your life's wealth there too. But so I set out to design this because I thought, well, you know, I've been doing avatars. Our whole teams have building that for years, and I thought I'm going to make something. This is actually based on a. Um, <laughs> wow, can you have a zipper? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> It's coming right into the vibrations through there. You guys got to work on an isolator. Um, so I put this together. I, I initially said, I don't know anything about sewing. So I took a class and I made a Renaissance doublet. I thought, that's cool because it looks like all John's things. And then I, it occurred to me that you could actually, that there was this thing called a peplum. And the peplum is this flappy thing. And so in the original double that I made, which was, was uh, kind of looked like a Renaissance thing, I thought, well, it doesn't look very cyber, but it has this floppy thing that you could put these pockets in and put netting in. So you could put lots of gear there. And then I said, well, you need to be able to string cords. Because you know you've got your iPod, the cords already flopping out, and Apple loves to show this on billboards as it looks cool. But in, in practice, if you're in New York, subway door closes and <laughs> you're on your iPod cord. You know, it's, it's not very practical, so I decided to make these channels. And I decided to make the channels, one big panel on the back, where the, uh, the cords could go up. And uh, the director of Sun Labs, who I know, this is Sun Microsystems, said, you know, if you make a panel like this, you can put a cell phone booster and pan up the back and, and give yourself tremendous reception. So what has actually started to happen is uh, there's a bunch of people who got interested in in this finally again, is to how to make cyber wares or cyber garments. I think this is a, a bunch of other things in here. This is an RFID tag here, in a curl up. And uh, this is a cool light, that just is a cool light. Because you could have electroluminescent uh, material in the, in the garment, or you could buy add-ons. There's no sleeves made. This is a zipper to put the sleeves on. And the sleeves would be made. And there's more on that later. But let's go to the next. So this is the was the construction of the garment. Go to the next slide. So here's all the all the gadgets that you're likely to have now. Maybe they will all get centralized into one. Who, who can who can take tell? And the things that I'm holding in my hand, if you go to the next slide, are these very interesting sort of nano servers. This is the these are the smallest servers. Uh, ever made. They're, they're, you know, they've just produced 45 alpha production. They run Java. They're Java native OS. They're the size of a matchbox, basically, or a cigarette pack to matchbox. Could be much smaller. They run for a long time on just regular batteries. And one of the things, that the, the properties they have is they can detect motion relative to the other servers. They sort of have a, a little ch chirping pattern that's going on. But it's a full server. It can serve out web pages, video, audio, you know, wireless, anything, Bluetooth. Uh, and so Sun's giving me a bunch of these. And what we're going to do is we're going to build them into the garment such that 
Um, you know, maybe there's one in the sleeve, maybe it'll be down to a wafer by the time we get an alpha. And as I walk, it's actually going to give me motion capture. So it's going to be able to project what I'm doing uh, into a virtual world or onto a cell phone where there may be a Java applet running that shows a walking figure that happens to be me. So where does this go? What can you do with this kind of crazy stuff? Well, say uh, what you're doing is you're sort of, sort of trying to project who you are to your friends, say at a party or on the other side of Times Square with the minimum of fuss. Now you can go like this, you can sit sit in Starbucks and do SMS messaging all day, or why can't you just express yourself by moving? Uh, and one of the concepts that they've talked about is getting free billboard time on Times Square, having the cyberware garment equipped with these servers, you can walk along and you can create a little collective art piece where your friends, as five friends or five random people selected, and they're up as avatars on the screen moving around doing a dance, and you don't even have to be next to the people. So you're grabbing public attention, you're grabbing a bit of cyberspace to, uh, to show something about who you are and where, what you're doing. So that's an idea of an, of an art piece. And I think uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the interesting, this is a fellow who was met, known to many of you, Andy Serkis, uh, who performed as Gollum and 40, 40 or so other characters, we may say, he did the voices. Uh, he was the ultimate example of this because in the shooting Peter Jackson's film in New Zealand, he wore this, you know, this full magnetized—I don't even know the technology—jumpsuit uh, that allowed him to have facial expression captured and all his body movement captured. And there's a, there's a version of Lord of the Rings where he is playing alongside all the main characters because they shot it live. He was not put in later. And when he bites into that fish, he's really biting into a real fish, that kind of thing, because that's the way Andy is. But he, um, he was then skinned as Gollum. And when his family went to see the Two Towers especially, they couldn't believe it. They were like, that's Andy. Everything he's doing is Andy. Now, we know it's Gollum, but that is our Andy. <laughs> and it was kind of creepy for them. But Andy was basically the first extremely high-performance avatar. Uh, that was captured in, 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 in this manner. So this is the kind of thing, I mean, if you wanted to express yourself, uh, it might eventually come to this. Now, of course, if, you, if your whole body was filled with sensors, then, then you'd have the skin that he has on the outside. Something like that. Or maybe it's nano pants, who knows. But let's go to the next, next one. This is how these servers work. Create more than one form of active class. Mm -hmm. And they call this echoplasm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Most movement space. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll do it this way. So, so that's the red line. I didn't pick up the red line. Oh, I didn't pick up the red line. It's through the red line. Oh, you dropped it on the floor again? Yeah, it's here on the power screen. So I can pick up the red line there. I can walk over to this. Now, yeah. so that that's the kind of stuff that. So it's, it's sort of hard to figure out how to put all this together, but things will get adopted in society if they're if they're fun or they do something cool. Uh, for the consumers. So how do you put all of this stuff together to create a whole digital clothing or digital salt that's walking through the world? And I don't know, uh, this is an ongoing experiment. We're going to make the third garment out uh, of different material because this is way too expensive to produce. This is the materials in here. This is in press velvet and stuff like that, which we got from the Metropolitan Opera uh, used you know, instead of $200 a yard. Um, but um, where is all this going? Well, you're probably going to be involved. At least some of you will be involved in some of that. And I think you're going to see, as we saw earlier, garments change. But what you are as a person and how you present yourself to the world uh, and how you interact is going to change radically. And I think by 2020, you're going to, it's not going to be just sort of 
people using their tooth as a cell phone, there's going to be all kinds of incredibly cool stuff going on uh, that you can wear and that you can present in the world. And people will, will actually look and act very different. I mean, they, they won't just be seeming like they're mad walking down the street talking on their, their cell phone, but they'll be doing all kinds of things, getting all kinds of signals and visuals and non-visual cues and, and touch cues as to what's going on. And uh, with that, I think that that's about, is that my time? That's about it. Well, thank you.